stress, fear, depression, spiritual warfare. Are you weighted down? Do you need refreshing? Welcome, welcome everyone to the Warriors for Christ podcast, where we seek to uplift, edify, and encourage you to be light and salt in a dark and tasteless world with your host, Kyle. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another exciting episode of Warriors for Christ podcast. I'm Kyle. And I'm Sam. And we are so glad that you're with us today. Brother Sam, what does the Lord put on your heart for this for this evening's show? Kyle, today we're going to look at the book of Luke. And in the book of Luke, we're going to go through and look about uh, at the different passages. And really, what does it mean when we look at the kingdom of God? And, and what it says, you know, when Jesus sent out the, the disciples and said, go and do these things and proclaim to people, the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so we're going to start in the beginning of the book and we're going to go through to the end. And we're going to look at what does it mean for the kingdom of God to come? What was the message that Christ, Christ proclaimed? How did people, some of the people respond to the teachings of Christ? whether or not they want to be a part of the kingdom of God. What does it cost? Who does Jesus say? And how does he say we obtain eternal life? Very important questions. So we're going to go through and look at those those passages in the book of Luke uh, and go through and talk about them. And I pray it's going to be a blessing to people. I agree. With that, I'll open us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day for your daily bread. We thank you for your truth and your word. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to share it in truth. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you open the ears, the eyes, and the hearts of those that are listening. We pray that your truth reaches their hearts, convicts them of sin, and the need to repent of it, Lord, and the need of your spirit in them to change their life as it changed ours. And Father, we're so grateful for that. We're thankful for this time together. And we pray, O oh Lord God, that you use us in a mighty way, and we're so thankful. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, so in, in Luke chapter 10, again, when Jesus sends out uh, 70 others, and he sends them out into, in pairs into every city uh, before him, before the places that he was, Jesus was going. So he sends them out in advance to prepare the way for Jesus to come. You know, Jesus tells them in Luke chapter 2, or Luke chapter 10, verse 2, he says the harvest is plentiful. There's, there's many people that don't know the truth, but there's a problem. What's the problem? He says in verse 2, chapter 10, and he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. See, God's seeking laborers for the kingdom of heaven. There's few. Yet even at the time when Jesus sent them out, they specifically were sent to the nation of Israel. They were sent to the people who claimed to be, have fellowship with God. They were sent to a people who claimed to have this fellowship and nearness, uh, a people who served the one true God. Yet God was rejecting many of the people. God didn't think the same way about them. We've covered this in many of the different episodes, Kyle, looking at Isaiah and Jeremiah, uh, looking at the nation of Israel. Uh, you know, we, we did the episodes of Is Your Faith Based Upon Truth or Lies, part one and part two, going through and examining some of what, how people think and comparing that to the example of Israel uh, when they came out of Egypt with Moses, just as we're commanded that that was for that's our example is written for our instruction in the New Testament. We looked at all those passages, and, and there's a lot of truth in there. And, and the same is today. But he would tell them, he would, he would send them in, he, he would say, go to the city and, and stay in a house. If there's a man of peace, then your peace will rest on him. But if not, he'll return to you. But go and stay in the house, eat, drink, and whatever they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. That's in verse 7. And then verse 9, it says, Heal those who are sick and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. Again, initially, 
the power of God was being displayed and manifest to show people there was a light, a light that they would be drawn to. There was a power, a power and authority that does not exist in the realm of darkness, but only when you come to light. And it was there to draw people into that light, to receive and to walk and to have fellowship as Christ did. And much of this, there was authority that was granted to the uh, apostles, the disciples, and not just the 12 disciples, but all these other 70. Uh, not because they had been born again yet, because the Spirit hasn't yet been given, but because authority had been given to them to, to give people, um, to help get their attention and, and to demonstrate that this gospel that was being proclaimed was one of power. It was, it was one of light from God. And the part of that authority was the works that they did. Um, and just while I'm still here in chapter 10, before we go back to the beginning of the book, you know, you look at uh, a very important question that a lawyer asks in verse 25. What was this very important question? And the lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus is going to ask him or answer him this this. Uh, the question that he asked. Very important question. What must I do to an inherit eternal life? Now, many people will probably think, oh, I, I know what Jesus is going to say. He's going to say, well, you just have to believe in me. Uh, he, he's going to say, just have faith. Well, Jesus does more than that. You see, those who have a true faith, a true belief, well, it, re- it results in being born again. It results in uh, being baptized in the Spirit, being baptized into to Christ, uh, receiving a new heart in the Spirit of God. And that does something. It has a result. It does a perfect work. And the result is there will be a proof of faith, as we discuss in the episode of James chapter 1 in the book of First Peter. Now Jesus, in answering this question of what shall I do to inherit eternal life, Jesus points him to a source to get his answer. Now, this answer that he gives is going to confound a lot of people because it's almost going to go against some of what they would say is a fundamental belief of theirs, which excludes this thing that Jesus points out. What does he point out as the source of the answer of how do I inherit eternal life in verse 26? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? So Jesus points him to the law. I see many people say that, uh, oh, the law doesn't apply to us. Well, actually, if you if you go in and we cover this in the book in the episode of um, Romans and Galatians and other books, it actually says that uh, Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Uh, we cover this in Matthew chapter five. Uh, Who's the greatest in the kingdom? The one who keeps and teaches, keeps the commandments and teaches others to do the same. Uh, but those whose righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees. And of course, as you continue to read his teachings, it has to be from the heart. The Pharisees didn't have a new heart in the spirit of God. So all their service to God was external works of the law, wasn't of the heart, which can only come through faith. You can only receive the spirit of God through faith to give you a new heart so that you can actually keep the requirements of the law from the heart. And fulfill the law. And we've covered a lot of that in in many different episodes by going through reading the word of God and how God explains it. So here, Jesus asks the, the man, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? Now, people who knew the intent, the spiritual aspect of the law, because it's it was very clear, we, we covered this in what does God always require? We covered that. We we looked at those things. We looked at the God wants the heart and his spirit to dwell in us so that we can keep the two greatest commandments. And we covered that of God requires a new heart, um, you know, part one and part two, looking at the New Testament and the Old Testament. But here the man answers him from the law. And what does he say the answer is in verse 27, or he, at least his answer? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. So that's what his answer was. He first starts off and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
Jesus points him to the law. Well, how's the law? What does it say to you? He answers with the two greatest commandments. Don't sin against God. Don't sin against your neighbor. That's right. Now, people who know what that means, if you go and you actually look to what God says what that means, and I'll point people, probably Romans chapter 13, verse 8 through 12, about what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself, you don't sin against them. When you don't sin, you don't break the law. When you don't break the law, you're no longer under the law. You fulfill the law. And the Spirit of God only leads people to produce spiritual fruit, those things and actions and behaviors which do not break the law. And that's the nature of a man being led by the Spirit of God. And so that's the result. That's that's what's produced. And Jesus says, did he say he answered correctly? And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. And, you know, that's consistent with Romans chapter 2, I think like verse 10 or 13, somewhere in there, where it says, it's not the hearer of the law but the doer, who is just before God, but the doer of the law will be justified. And you're like, what do you mean the doer of the law will be justified? I thought works of the law can't save you, but faith, you're right. He's not saying go and try to um, – do works of the law, follow uh, external laws and paper. But you see someone who's being led by the Spirit of God fulfills the law. They do the law, not by seeking to do written rules on paper, but because it's written in their heart. And as you keep reading in Romans chapter 2, it talks about the Gentiles who do not have the law. They never had the law. They instinctively fulfill, they do the law because they have the law of God written in their heart. Their conscience bears witness. And it goes on to say at the end of chapter 2 that the one who is a true Jew and the one who's a true circumcision is not the one who's a physical descendant of a Jew or physically circumcised, but the one who is spiritual, who, who is inwardly, who has been circumcised, not of flesh, not with hands, not with the letter of the law, but with the Holy Spirit of God. And if people would let themselves be instructed by what God has to say and be spiritually baptized and understand what this means and the work that God does and they put their faith in that, then God could fulfill it and he could do an impossible work in their life. They could be transformed into a new creation. They could have all the fullness and the power to the deity of God in him. But most people, again, you look at their life compared to the life of the moral atheist in them in the world, and they look no different. You're like, how can you say you have the power of the Almighty God in you? Uh, The same power that the Bible says that those who have been born again have the same fullness of deity that Christ had, the same power, the same spirit. How, How can your life be more like the moral center of the world and not like Christ? Amen. That's a great question. Because Christ isn't in them. Just like the Bible commands, examine yourself. See if you're in the faith. Test yourself unless you realize this, that you fail the test. Before that, he says, you know, the problem is you have jealousy, you have strife, you have anger, uh, you have outbursts, you have, you have all these problems that the world has. He says, when are you guys going to repent? When are you going to have true repentance? See, true repentance, Kyle, is you turn and you don't continue to do it. You don't struggle. It's not a war. The power of God puts it to death. It's spiritual baptism, being crucified with Christ. Most people don't know what that is. Listen to the episode we did on Romans chapter 6. Listen to the episode that we did on the book of Colossians that talks about those topics. The book of Ephesians that talks about the new man. And what it means to be the perfect man, the same measure of fullness of Christ, uh, receiving all the fullness of God himself. As we cover all those in chapter, uh, you know, going through and looking at chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4 of Ephesians. It's all there. Or the book of 2 Peter. Peter talks about it. Same thing. How you enter into the kingdom of heaven. How to make certain about God's election and about your entry into the kingdom of heaven. The way in which you will never stumble. Now, back to the beginning of Luke. You know, chapter 1. Luke Luke wrote these things down. Why were these things written down in verse 4 of chapter 1? So that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. The exact truth, Kyle. You see, the devil 
will take the word of God and preach it. But he distorts it so that you'll receive a different Christ, a different spirit, a different gospel. Or as in Galatians, he says, I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you. But he says, for a gospel, although it's it's not really a different gospel, it's still the gospel of Christ, but there's people that are distorting it. They're like, you add a little bit, you take a little away, and the next thing you know, he says, if anyone comes, and even though they're preaching this gospel of Christ, but they're 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 making these little subtle distortions of it, he says they're accursed. Amen. He says they're accursed. He says it twice. So let's look at this. Let's look at some of the principles here in, in Luke. And as the Spirit of God leads me, I'm, I'm just going to point out different things of, of uh, truths that I think people have overlooked. The exact truth. That's right. So first, we, we know that Jesus came to call the sinners, not the righteous. You see, there were righteous people. Righteous people already have great standing with God. He didn't come to call them. He came to call the sinners because the sinners and the ungodly do not enter the kingdom of heaven. Peter talks about this in his books that he writes. We covered it in uh, 1 Peter. It's actually specifically stated in uh, chapter 4 of 1 Peter, but there's so much truth leading up to that. Sinners are in trouble. But that's why The Father sent his Son into the world so we could be changed. Changed. I didn't say the same person, Kyle. Changed. A new creation. From the old to the new. From darkness to light. From salty to fresh. From a leavened loaf to an unleavened bread. Different person. Changed. Not accept you so that you can be the same person. The new man. That's right. The old man doesn't enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, as we look through uh, John the Baptist, they're going to be talking about John the Baptist. What does it say about John the Baptist's parents in verse 6? They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Now, we know as we continue to read the New Testament that the Bible commands that those who have been spiritually born again are to be blameless and walk blamelessly until the day of Christ, to walk and abide in holiness, uh, to, to be unblemished, to walk just as Christ walked, to be holy as the Heavenly Father is holy, to be perfect as the Father is perfect. Uh, again, holy in all of our behavior, to be a holy living sacrifice, proving the will of God, uh, all that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Our lives now as that holy living sacrifice, as a priest offering up our bodies and our lives each day and our conduct, holy and pure, to our Heavenly Father as the sacrifice, just as Christ did. Well, you can't do that until you become a partaker through the sufferings of Christ and receiving the Spirit of God through His death. That's why we must be baptized, spiritually baptized into the death of Christ so we've become a partaker and be made alive by the same Spirit of God through the resurrection and walk in the newness of life now in the current body, which is what is discussed in Romans chapter 6 and what it means to be spiritually baptized and then talks about what the result is. Now, as, as we look through his uh, their, their child, which is going to be John the Baptist, what does it say about him? And why was he going to be such a great person? And mighty in verse 15 to verse 17. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The key there, Kyle, that was read, is to turn the hearts. You see, from the very beginning, God said, and we covered it in the the episode with, um, is your faith based upon truth or lies? 
Israel did not have a heart to know God. The problem and the reason why they could not continue in walking away pleasing to God and to obey His voice, which is what He always required, was because they had a bad heart. Even though the people believed in God, even though they feared God, even though they were purchased with the blood of the Lamb, they were redeemed, they were called the firstborn of God, His chosen one, His arm brought salvation to them, God subsequently destroys most of them. Yeah, and something they, something that you pointed out there in this that I just you know, I have to I have to touch on is it to turn the hearts and then the connection there and the, because of that it makes ready a people prepared for the Lord. Without that heart turned, they're not prepared for the for the spirit. Well, correct. And the other aspect is when they have a bad heart, you're disobedient. But when you get a new heart, then you become the attitude of the righteous. Uh, those who are obedient and walk in righteousness, Mm -hmm. which again is the result of the new creation. When you go and you look at when we talk about this of what the new creation is, and you go and look at the person who's been sanctified by the Holy Spirit that Peter talks about in the very, very beginning of those who are elect of God that have been sanctified by the Holy Spirit of God, it results in what? Obedience to Jesus Christ and being sprinkled with his blood. And as you continue to go through and read that, he explains it in the book of First Peter and those who enter the kingdom of heaven and those who receive the blessing. Same with Second Peter. It's the same message as discussed in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2 through 5, that we discussed in that episode, as well as the book of Colossians. These are all the same message, as well as what it means to be born again in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. When you look at all of it and put it together, it contrasts between the old man versus the new man. The exact truth about the things you have been taught. So these are important things important for people to understand. Now, one of the things when you look at Christ and you say, well, what was the difference between Christ? Uh, you know, it's like you have people when they receive the Holy, the Holy Spirit of God is in them and upon them. They're, they're able to do great and mighty things. Uh, they are able to speak the words of God. They become a prophet of God. God speaks through them. He gives them his words. Uh, they're able to do the works of God. Again, because God is with them. They have the fellowship of the Spirit. Well, the difference between Christ and others, you, when you look at Moses and you and, and you go through and you look at all these uh, great men of God, uh, you, know, you know, you think of Enoch, Noah, Abraham, uh, Moses, and you just keep going through, you know, David, uh, Samuel. And these people had the Spirit of God. Now, but they didn't start with that. They were all born into sin. Now, Christ wasn't born into sin. You see, the other people, when they, when they drew near to God, they had, they had, to, they had their, their sacrifice of an animal because there had to be blood for the atonement, the forgiveness of sin. Now, we, we cover this in Hebrew, the difference between the blood of bulls versus the blood of Christ. You know, both offer, offer atonement for sin, forgiveness of sin. But only one offers a way to be to take away sin. You see, God never, he said he never wanted the continual sacrifice of sin. He wanted obedience. But you can't have obedience until you get the new heart. And that's where it goes back to Israel coming out of the wilderness. The reason why God rejected them wasn't because they said they didn't believe in him or they didn't fear God or they didn't follow him. Well, they did. They tried to. But all their efforts was in the weakness of man's wisdom with a bad heart, and they continued to stumble. And so God rejected them because they could never come into obedience. He str- and, and then it continued, not just with that, 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 group, that generation, but subsequent generations. When you re- read in the book of Isaiah, and we, and we covered chapter 1 of Isaiah, where it talks about how can you have your sins that were red as scarlet and, and red like crimson? How can they maybe white like snow and white like wool? God says, well, you, let's come. Let's reason together. And then he gives the conditional statement. And he tells them what he requires. He says, the problem is I, I, I struck you. I disciplined you with the rod. But you never came into obedience. You never got the new heart. You never got the new spirit. And so the only thing I could do was keep striking you because you never yielded and came into obedience. Just like in Romans chapter 12, the son that's disciplined, unfortunately, the illegitimate son never comes into disobedience or never comes into obedience. 
You see, when we respond to the discipline of the Lord and he gets our attention and we come under his terms and faith of what God says he wants and what he requires, and we get the new heart and the new spirit, we're transformed into a new creation. We now walk as Christ walked. We abide in light. Amen. And when that happens, as it says of the son who's not illegitimate, but a legitimate son in Hebrews chapter 12, the crooked paths are made straight. Obedience then turns into yielding the peaceful fruit of righteousness once someone has come under the discipline and has been trained by the discipline of the Father and has responded to it. They come to light. Their paths are made are, are made from crooked to straight. The members that are lame and, and suffering and, and have unrighteousness in the members are now healed so they can produce the peaceful fruit of righteousness. But yet people don't understand these. They they take these this false terminology of what does it mean to be disciplined by the Father, and they, they turn it into this ridiculous statement that because I'm continuing to be in discipline by the Lord, therefore I'm a son of God. I said, no, you aren't. You're illegitimate. Do you not even read the Bible? There's three places in the Bible that talks about the discipline of the Son and those who are his and those who aren't. Isaiah chapter 1, you have Hebrews uh, chapter 12, I think the other one is Deuteronomy chapter 8. We cover this, I think, in the Hebrews chapter 12 chapter. I'm just pointing these things out as I'm convicted, as I read through, and the Spirit convicts me to speak these things. But Jesus, he was called the Son of God because he was born of the Spirit of God. He was able to be the sacrifice for all people, for all, all kind. And all Gentiles, even though they didn't have the law and they didn't practice the traditions of the law to offer a sacrifice for the atonement of sin, because Jesus lives forever. He offered his own life. So because of that, he can now be high priest to all mankind, all Gentiles that come to him, not not, not through people who didn't know the, the traditions of Israel. They can come to him, but it's what God wants them. Not to continue to think that you can continue to live the same life and to think that now you can continue to offer as a sacrifice the blood of Christ and trample underfoot the Son of God and as regard as unclean the blood by which you've been sanctified. No, God won't allow that. Amen. You have to come to him in faith that God's going to change you into new creation, give you a new heart and new thoughts. And some of that will cover in Luke. But it's important. We have to look at all this truth because it all has to come together in harmony. Now, Christ, so he he comes in, he's born. It says in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. Now, the Bible, when you continue to read in the scripture, it says that he's actually uh, the firstborn. There's many other born of God, many other children of God, sons of God. It says that Jesus isn't afraid to call us brethren to his father because we're of the same seed, born of the same spirit, born of God. Those who are born of the spirit of God are also called sons of God. The difference is Jesus was the firstborn and he was born sinless because he was born directly of the seed of God, not the seed of man. Now, he was born with the weakness of the flesh because he was born of the flesh through the woman, but it was the seed of God, the the uh, the the holy conception uh, wasn't of man, and we know that sin is passed down through the seed of men, uh, and that's I think that comes out a little bit in Romans and in other places. But when we're born again, we're cleansed from all unrighteousness, receive the same fullness of deity that Christ had, the same measure of stature of fullness that He had. That it's called the perfect man, or some people translate it the mature man in Ephesians chapter four, verse thirteen. I'm like, okay. Whatever you want to use, it's it's the same nature that Christ had. So if you want to call it mature, even though it says teleos, which is perfect, that's fine. As long as we understand what that means. And we and, have an episode up on And on we have perfect. an episode that goes all through that. And, and it talks about that, of what that looks like. Now, after uh, John the Baptist was born, uh, continuing in chapter 1, Uh, His father, filled with the Holy Spirit, began prophesying and speaking of the things of God. And he talks about remembering the covenant in verse 72, the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father. And when you start looking at some of this, how he describes it, this oath, this, this what he swore. He says in verse 74 and 75, what does he say? 
to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. You see, God desires us to serve him. Not to serve sin, but to serve him. Our spiritual service of worship is to offer our lives as a holy living sacrifice, proving the will of God in our lives, all that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. The life that's discussed in Romans chapter 12, that cannot happen unless you've been born again as a son of God that's discussed in Romans chapter 6. And it contrasts that with the old man or the new man or the adulterous woman in Romans chapter 7, then continues to describe that adulterous woman in the second half of chapter 7 of the person who's still a slave of sin, has not yet been set free, has not been spiritually baptized. They're convicted by the things of God because that's what the word of God does. It convicts, it brings about to show that you're a sinner. In your mind, you're convicted. The problem is in your body, you cannot overcome because the members of your body are still a slave of sin. You're still a wretched man. You're still condemned. Who will set you free from that body of death? Only God can. That's right. Through his son, Jesus Christ. That's right. And in humility. So that person who's condemned, all they can do is try to serve God in their mind, but yet in their body, they're still a slave of sin. So then in the very next verse of chapter 8 of Romans chapter uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, says, Therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For it's the law of the Spirit of life. The law of the Spirit of life that was in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Amen. Because the written law was weak. Why was it weak? Because people of flesh, they have a sinful flesh. The written law cannot overcome sin in a person's life. But the law of the Spirit can. The law of the Spirit of life can. The same law of the Spirit that was at work in Christ that allowed him to live a perfect life, that allowed him to know know the thoughts of God, to speak the words of God, to do the works of God, and to live a holy and blameless life, his life as a spiritual sacrifice to his Father, the same command that we have. It says, those who live... He says, the requirement of the law, I think this is in chapter 8, uh, Romans chapter 8, I think it's in verse 4, it says, the requirement of the law, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Amen. Because those who walk according to the Spirit, they prove the will of God in their life. Amen. Those who walk according to the Spirit, their life is a holy living sacrifice to God. Those who walk... According to the Spirit, only produce spiritual fruit, good fruit, not bad fruit. They have a new heart. The power of God guides them in their life. They live an impossible life. And yet people who want to quarrel and wrangle and argue over words and ask controversial questions, it's because, Kyle, they've never experienced the power of God in their life. Amen. They have a power that's constrained to the weakness of the flesh, and they just cannot overcome They stumble in their thoughts because they still have a bad heart. All these thoughts come from the bad heart. We're going to learn more about this. We've covered all this in all these different books that we've been reading in the Bible and other episodes. Now, as we continue to look, uh, we know that as uh, as Jesus came, uh, John went as a forerunner before him. And in chapter 2, right, it says, uh, uh, and this is actually now when uh, Christ, when Jesus came and Jesus was uh, brought to the temple. Uh, Another man I want to point out, uh, the the priest at the time. When Jesus was brought to the temple uh, for dedication, I believe it was, the firstborn uh, that opens the womb, right? You're to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, to Yahweh, uh, per, per the, the Old Testament. And what does it say in verse 25? And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. That's right. Now, again, another righteous man. The Holy Spirit was upon him. Again, Jesus did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. 
Now, the Spirit of God told this man that Yahweh's Christ, as is discussed in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, everything is just kurios, kurios, kurios. It's the generic Greek word for Lord. So everyone is referred as the same Lord. In the Old Testament, it typically always exclusively used the proper name of God, Yahweh, Jehovah, however you pronounce it, the, you know, the yod heh vav heh the Tetragrammaton. And when you look at the Old Testament, how it's written, it always re- it refers to it's, it's Yahweh's Christ, Yahweh's anointed one, Yahweh's servant. And that's what we're talking about here. Jesus was Yahweh's Christ or the Father's Christ, the Father's servant, the Father's anointed. And Simeon comes in the spirit into the temple in verse 27. And when his parents brought the child Jesus to carry him, uh, to carry out for him the custom of the law, he took him in his arms, blessed God, and said, Now, Lord, again referring to the Father, Yahweh, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared, and the presence of all the people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. As we continue to go through Luke, we're going to see what this message of light is. What is this truth that's now being brought to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel? You see, Jesus was a blessing to both. Uh, And and it's the same thing. Moses was there to bring the people, to turn them, their heart to the Lord, to show them that all God wanted was them to receive of the new heart and the spirit of God. And we read that when you go through and we cover those teachings in Deuteronomy. But the people had a stubborn, rebellious heart. They wouldn't submit and repent. As a matter of fact, even God specifically spoke to them and verbally, audibly gave the people the Ten Commandments from the from the mountain before he wrote them down and gave them to Moses. And the people trembled and said, we don't want to ever hear your voice again. Uh, we'll die. And so God says, okay, you've spoken well. You won't hear my voice again. And in Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 18, uh, as he's talking to Moses and Moses speaks, he says, okay, um, God is going to raise up for a prophet for you, just like me. And it is his voice that you are to listen to. And if you don't listen to his voice, then you'll be destroyed. Because again, he's going to be Yahweh's servant, Yahweh's prophet. It's the same gospel that was proclaimed in the book of Acts when, when Peter and John and Peter got up and spoke. And it's it's recorded several times in the beginning of Acts in like chapter 3, 4, 5, where he talks about again, uh, as it was said, Moses, uh, as Moses quoted, God's going to raise up a prophet for you just like him. Uh, and he's going to proclaim truth. He's going to pr- proclaim the words of God. And the Spirit of God is going to be with him. But people don't want to listen. They they just they think they know the truth. Now, one of the things I'm also going to point out is there's this false understanding that many people think that it's this progressive sanctification. They don't understand that when you actually go and you study the word sanctification in the Bible, which we did an episode on this, sanctification is an event, not a process. You can go through, look at it. It's it's past tense. It's it's past tense, indicative, you know, aorist, which is a past completed event. It's also used in the perfect tense, which is something that's been completed in the past, results already done. And that that's referring to being freed from sin and the practice of sin. Amen. The power and the practice of sin. That's separate from continuing to grow in spiritual wisdom and understanding and gifts of the Spirit and works of God and other knowledge. Amen. Not being freed from sin. That, that's a cleansing and a sanctification and holiness that God does so you can continue to walk in righteousness. But the level of how much good fruit you continue to produce, uh, the level of spiritual maturity and spiritual gifts that you do, that's a growing You see, even Christ grew in wisdom and strength and in different aspects of God. But he wasn't growing out of sin. He was perfectly cleansed of sin from the very beginning, sin-free. The Bible says he was tempted in all things without sin. That's right. But he continued to grow in those different things. Just as it says in Hebrews, uh, you know, uh, Jesus learned... um, through the things which he suffered, uh, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. In Hebrews chapter 5. 
So here in in Luke chapter 2, verse 39, what does it say about Jesus in verse 39 and 40? Chapter 2, verse 39 and 40. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city of Nazareth. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. There you go. He continued to grow in wisdom. And again, uh, as you continue to read, uh, they they rep- so it they, it goes on, and that's that's after they did that. Then it says, as you continue reading, they continued each year to go up to the feast of Passover at Jerusalem, and then later, when he was twelve years old, uh, they went back to the one of the times they went back to Jerusalem. So it's many years later they go back, and when they went back, they. They didn't realize that they he had been left behind, and, and he was uh, in the temple. And they went and they found him in the temple because they were anxiously looking for him. And he said, why is it that you're looking for me? Did you not know I had to be in my father's house in verse uh, 49? And they didn't understand that statement. And he went back uh, to Nazareth with them. And what did it say as he continued to live? You know, he's now 12 years old. And, and after that, what does it say in verse 52? In verse 52. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Yep. Jesus kept increasing in favor with God and men. And, you know, a lot of people don't, they don't understand. What do you mean? How, do you, how, how is he increasing with favor? Well, it's just like when you look at the Hebrews. Uh, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered and having been made perfect and make him, became all of those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Now, when you look at Peter, the first Peter episode that we did, and we said, what finds favor with God? The Bible tells us what finds favor with God. If for the sake sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrow when suffering unjustly. It says, there's no favor with God if you continue to sin. Amen. But when you do what is right without sin and you suffer for these things and are persecuted and you patiently endure for the sake of God, he says that finds favor with God. For you being called for this purpose, since Christ suffered for you, leaving for you an example for you to follow in his steps. This is your example, which was also Christ's example, but now also your example. If you follow the same example of obedience, if you commit no sin, you have no deceit in your mouth. While being reviled, you don't revile in return. While suffering, you utter no threats. It goes on to say that Jesus, in verse, this is all in chapter 2, like verse 17 on. And verse 24, he says, Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we being dead to sin might now live in righteousness. We're to be living in righteousness. Again, being converted from the sinner to the righteous. As you continue to look through, read through the book of Peter, he tells you we're no longer to be sinning. Chapter 4, verse 1, referring to those who have already been baptized, receiving the good conscience at the end of chapter 3, he says, arm yourself with the same purpose. And Christ suffered in the flesh. Arm yourself with the same purpose, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Amen. So as to live the rest of the time in his life, no longer for the lust of men, but now for the will of God. He's talking about us, not Christ. Christ did not have to cease from sin. He was never a slave of sin. We are the ones that are born a slave of sin. We are the ones that have to stop sinning. And in verse 40, just to reiterate, uh, this is chapter 2, verse 40. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And when we go to Titus chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us, that's the grace of God, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Amen. And that's what it is. That's what the grace of God does. Now, it can only do that if you believe that God can make you into the the holy, perfect, sanctified vessel. If you believe that the power of God has the ability to convert you from a sinner to a righteous person, to free you from sin, is that what your faith is? Kyle, most people who I meet and talk to who are who profess themselves as a Christian continue to live in sin. Powerless. You, you know, it's like at the end of Titus chapter 1, it says, you know, to the pure, all things are pure because they are pure. They walk in purity. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. The problem is in their mind, in their conscience, They're defiled. You see, they don't have the new heart, the new conscience. They're still defiled. Jesus says, you know what defiles a man? Your thoughts. Thoughts. 
Forget about your actions. You have anger and hate towards another person. Murder in the heart. You've already God already charges you a murder. Lust after a woman, adultery. And your thoughts, you're already guilty. And that's what people don't understand. The pure don't have those things. They've been cleansed. They have a new heart. All unrighteousness has been removed. They've been cleansed from all unrighteousness. The Bible does not say some. He says all. God is a jealous and holy God. How much darkness is in there? None. Well, that gets back to this is the message we, we heard from him and announced to you. And this is in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, when he says, what is the gospel? Actually, verse 5, what is the gospel message? God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. Well, the problem is this church in, in 1 John was saying they had fellowship with God. And verse 3 says, you know, I'm writing these things to you so that you might have fellowship. He says, I have fellowship with the Father and the Son. I want you to have fellowship too. But the problem is they didn't, at least this first group of people. So he tells them, you know, this is the message we heard from Christ. And now to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness. None. People probably scratch their head say, how is that the gospel? Well, you see, it's because you don't understand. When you're created in a new creation and you become one with the Father and one with Son, God doesn't allow unholiness and wickedness and sin to abide with him. He cleanses it all. You're forgiven. You're right. Because without forgiveness, he can't cleanse you. Amen. So there had to be a death and atonement. And then there's a cleansing. He removes the wicked heart. It's the heart. That is the source of all of our wickedness. And people don't understand that. They're so blind. I, but, but but people, you're, you weren't the only ones. For 47 years, I suffered with that same thing. And I was so we're, we're, blind If you well. hear this from us and you're thinking, oh, you guys are so sanctimonious. No, trust us. We were in the same shoes until we actually understood the truth. And God changes you instantly. And instantly. then the power can come. Amen. But these people, he says, but you say that you have fellowship with God. But you walk in darkness. You lie and you do not practice the truth. The truth is not in. Now he's speaking to people who don't have fellowship. He's telling them how to have fellowship. He says, if if you walk in light, if, conditional if, if you walk in light, as God himself is light. We just said in him there is no darkness at all. None. Then you have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Now, again, he's speaking to people who don't have fellowship with God yet. They don't have the new heart. So what's still, what, what, Kyle, if somebody doesn't have a new heart, they still have a bad heart. Correct. A bad heart is a heart of sin. That's right. So if you say that you have no sin. Then you're a liar. Then you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. And the truth is not in you. Because these people don't have fellowship with God. They still have the old heart that sin dwells. They never got cleansed. They never got sanctified. So he's telling them, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 90, all. 90%? No, all, Kyle. 75. No, 100. 100%. 100%. See? 100% all, folks. If you say you've never committed a sin, now he switches from the noun, which is the state of the heart. Now he goes to the verb, past tense, because some of the Jews were like, oh, no, I've kept the law. I've kept the law. Then they're a liar. Well, no, you've, everyone has committed a sin. One, there's, there's the state of sin, and then there's the committing the sin. Two things change. Well, one, before you come to God, you have the bad heart. You have sin. That's the noun. That's in verse 8. Yep. Uh, verse 10. I just jumped ahead a little bit. That's all. In 1 John chapter 1 is the verb. And, and sometimes people don't know this because it says sin, sin. Well, yeah. If you go and you look it up in the Greek, the first one's the state. It's the noun. You have a bad heart until you get the new heart. The second one in verse 10 is an act. Is the verb referring to past tense of that previous life. But then as you continue to move forward into chapter 2 of 1 John, he's now speaking to the little children. He says, he's, now I'm writing these things to you. And then he goes on and talks about all that. Now, we've covered all this in the 1 John episode. Yeah. We've covered it, uh, or the righteousness, which is 1 John and, and 1 Peter, and also in the John 3.16. So I don't want to go more in there. I want to get back to, to Luke. But that's just some additional information that people can go listen to those podcasts. Now, John the Baptist comes along, and again, he's preparing the way. Uh, you know, just Jesus prepared the way for his father. John the Baptist is preparing the way for Christ. And what does he say he preached in verse 3? In verse 3 of chapter 3. And he came 
into all the is- into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight and the rough roads smooth and all flesh will see the salvation of God. Now in Hebrew, that would be the actual name of Jesus, the salvation of God. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Yahusha, Yeshua, however well, you want and, to And that's what it means. You know, yeah. And you actually look at that. That was the same name of Joshua yeah. uh, in the English pronunciation. It's, it's, you know, if you want to look at Christ's name, it's the same as Joshua. But instead of calling him Joshua, they, they, because Yahushua, Joshua, and then they just changed it to Jesus. It's the same name of when Joshua led Israel into the promised land, and it means the salvation of Yahweh. Because God gives names to the people who work through him. You know, you can look at all the names of the prophets and the names that they have. It's always what God did through them. Yep. But the point is baptism for the repent uh, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins we're supposed to be immersed in something now John the Baptist was proclaiming uh the foreshadowing of the kingdom you have to be immersed in something different to come out of the sin and turn now when John the Baptist came a lot of people say oh no no you see uh repentance is about a change of mindset in this well you know in a way that is true when you look at John the Baptist and what he came proclaiming in advance but you you have to it has to be fulfilled in your life through the spirit and the power of God until that's done it, it's nothing a heart change now there has to be repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, John the Baptist knew, you know, and look at what he said to people. People will say, oh, you need to speak more kindly to people. Well, let's look at this. In verse 7, it says, the first part of verse 7, it, he, he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him. Now, does it say these crowds were going out to persecute him? No. They wanted to follow him. They wanted to participate in their zeal to find God. So he's speaking to a people that are going out to him to accept what he has to say, to With be zeal. baptized by him, accept this message of repentance. But you see, the Spirit of God is upon him, just like is in Israel back. God knows all these people had a wicked heart. So, speaking to these people who are coming to be baptizing, accepting the message that John has proclaimed for them, how does John speak to this crowd? You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, is it it just a mindset or is it a lifestyle? What does he say in verse 8? Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you, that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. And what happens if you don't bear fruit in, in your actions and in your life in verse 9? Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, we know as we continue to read, and Kyle, we cover this in depth. We look at all the gospel books in the New Testament. We looked at God Requires a New Heart, part one, starting with the New Testament verses. Part two is the Old Testament verses. And we covered what Jesus taught and what it means to be a good tree or a bad tree. And he, and he equates it to the good tree is the man with a good heart, the good treasure. The bad tree is the man with a bad heart. So until you get a new heart, Kyle, until you receive the heart of God and the spirit of God and what that does. Now, a lot of people think they've received a good heart. I was like, no, you don't know. Listen to what Jesus defines of the teaching of the good and the bad heart, and you'll know if you received it or not. Do you still have the wicked thoughts, the bad thoughts that just pop up randomly that you can't even control? Well, you don't have any control of it because it comes from the heart, the seat within you. It's automatically produced as an involuntary response to to things that happen in your life. Now, you may then try to outwardly control those things because you're convicted by the way of God. The problem is you've already been condemned because God judges you in the thoughts of your heart. 
And that's fundamentally what people don't understand, Kyle. They now, I know this because I've read ahead. I've read all the books. I know what it means to be a good tree or a bad tree. Good tree can only bear good fruit. And in Luke chapter 6, he's going to talk a little bit about this. But the key is, the only way to become a good tree is you have to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And that's why, again, he said, those who are going to be coming in under the covenant of Christ, he's going to baptize you with the Spirit. And that's discussed later in verse 16 of chapter 3. Now, moving on to chapter 4, let's look at some of the aspects of the Spirit of God. Now, we know the Holy Spirit of God leads men of God, the servants of God, those who are sons of God, leads them to do the will of God, to walk in righteousness. We, we saw that with John the Baptist. We saw that with uh, Zacharias. We saw that with Simeon. And now with Jesus. Was Jesus led by the Spirit of God in chapter 4, verse 1? Yes, he was. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now, he was led around by the Spirit of God. And as you continue to read the rest of chapter 4, he talks about when the devil tempted him. And he tempts, tempts him three times. Now, of course, Jesus has the Spirit of God, the law of the Spirit of life, even though it's in the, the, the weakness of the flesh, dwelling in, in human flesh, the Spirit is able to overcome and make the flesh strong. Now, the, the written law, uh, works of the law from the written law, cannot overcome the weakness of the flesh. Uh, you'll continue to stumble. No matter how hard you try, you'll continue to stumble because you have the bad heart. But the law of the Spirit puts a new heart, puts the power of God in there, and even though you're still in the body of the weakness of the flesh, you're able to overcome. That's why Christ was able to overcome. He was born sinless because he was not born of man, but of the seed of God. And then he continued to maintain that per that perfect that perfect life, the perfect man, by abiding and walking in the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God only leads you in holiness. And these the are the same. God was upon him. And these are the same things it talks about of those who receive the same Spirit and the same grace. But people are ignorant of the grace of God. They only they they take what they they think, but it, it's 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 being constrained and restricted by the weakness of man's experience, and they won't put their faith in an impossible work of God. It's a, it truly is a a, a a leap of faith. Because until no man can live the life that God requires, you can only put faith that God can do that. And when you finally do, Kyle, what happens? You get made into a completely new man. Your Amen. thoughts and desires change. Amen. And then you get powerful gifts. It's awesome. Amen. So again, Jesus in verse 14, he returned in the power of the Spirit. And news about him was spreading. Now, Jesus goes and he starts speaking his first message. And again, most people are, are clueless about the nature of Christ, which really is the Spirit of God and how the Spirit of God responds to people. People will say, oh, God's a loving God. Oh, he is. And he also has a very uh, righteous anger and a burning wrath for those who are rebellious. And you read about it in the Old Testament and it continues in the New Testament through the end of the, the book of Revelation. But people ignorant of this fact, they always, in their mind, I think they create a false sense of how Jesus responded to people. Jesus is very compassionate and kind to the sinner that comes in humility, saying, I need to be changed. To the sinner that's beating his chest and saying, oh, I'm such a wretched man. I, I am so unworthy um, in the state that I'm in. But they come to God and God says, okay, I can change you. I can do an impossible work. But Many people are oblivious to how God speaks to a people who claims to be a servant of God, who claims to have fellowship with God, who claims to be a, a Christian. And you see these examples of people who claim to be servants of God from the Old Testament all the way through the New. And God is very sharp and harsh with those people because they still have a stubborn heart. They're rebellious. They're slaves of sin, servants of the devil, sons of the devil, as Jesus calls them, and the prophets of God calls them, both in the Old and the New Testament. But yet the people continue to claim that they're servants of God, that they're a holy people, a sanctified people of God. And they say, how dare you talk to me this way? I say, no, you don't understand. This is God. And this is how he speaks to you through his people who have the spirit of God. So let's look at this. Again, the spirit of the Lord is upon me as he's reading. 
And chapter 4, verse 18, when Jesus takes the book, he's there in Nazareth where he grew up. He's at the synagogue. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Release to the captives. Recovery of sight to the blind. To set those uh, to set free those who are oppressed. To proclaim the favorable, favorable year of the Lord. Now, he closes the book. He sits down. He says in verse 21 that today's scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, what's the people's initial response to the words of the first part of verse 22? And all were speaking well of him and wondering at his gracious words, which were falling from his lips. Like, wow, these are really gracious words. Wow, what a, what a, a beautiful message that we've heard from him. But then as, as time continues to go on, some start saying, oh, but isn't this Joseph's son? And then Jesus responds to them. Now, he was very direct with his words. Now, again, the people were just like, many of the people were like, oh, what gracious words. And they were amazed. And all of a sudden, they go from, oh, what a what a wonderful sermon and amazed at his teaching to in a few moments, they go to being filled with rage. They want to murder him and throw him off a cliff. And you're like, well, how could they do that? Because Jesus spoke truth, people. The words of God spoken in truth to those who are in darkness but want to claim that they're in light, it brings out the true nature in their heart. Now, they may not say anything. I'll tell you, Kyle, there's a lot of people who have anger in their heart and murder in their heart for me. He said, that's how God sees them. They'll say, oh, I don't have murder. Yeah, I do have anger at you, but I don't have murder. Well, in your eyes, you don't, but in God's eyes, you do. Uh, and they're no different than these people. So these people, he says in verse 23, what does he say to them? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Yeah, no prophet is welcome. And then he goes on and, and kind of says some things that basically God blesses the, the Gentile, but not them. What does he say in verse 25 to 27? But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were, was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And so, again, Jesus is pointing out that even though these were a people of God and that God had chosen them and wanted to bless them because they wouldn't get a new heart and a new spirit, uh, God was against these people. He was against them. And so, instead of a blessing them, he didn't bless them. He actually cursed them, as he said. He forsaked them, as he promised in Deuteronomy. After he says, I will never leave you and forsake you, then a very few verses later, he then prophesies. He says he'll destroy the people. He'll uproot them. He says he'll forsake them. And he does exactly what he prophesied. Because the people forsake God. So he says, okay, I'm going to forsake you. Conditional. But most people call are ignorant and they only know half the half the truth, and all their half truths, they take it as an absolute. When it's not, it's conditional because they don't know the word of God. Kyle, they quote fractions of the word of God, no different than what the devil does. Now, unfortunately, most of them do it in ignorance. It's like what the Bible says in the New Testament in 2 Timothy. He says, most of the people who are deceiving others are deceived themselves. They don't even know they're deceived. They go around as a people professing, confessing God. But by their deeds, they deny him. Just as what is said in, in uh, Titus chapter 1 and verse 16. By their deeds, they deny him. But they confess him. But by their deeds, they deny him. That's right. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. And so people, this is the first recorded message of Jesus' teaching. And people are blind. They don't even know. I say, you don't think Jesus offended people? They got in a rage. <laughs> they wanted to throw him off a cliff. The people first speak kind and gracious words to him. They're like amazed at his teaching, but you see, the Spirit of God knows a person's heart. And the Spirit of God is not going to pat you on the back and say, good job, you're on your way to the kingdom of heaven when you aren't. 
The Spirit of God is going to tell you who you are. Amen. You're still a son of the devil. You're still a son of disobedience. That's discussed in Ephesians chapter 2. If you haven't received the new heart, if you haven't been freed of those thoughts, stop being rebellious and stop resisting the blessing that God wants to give you. You are not serving God. You continue to propagate a lie. You're you're taking your own life and destiny to hell, and you're leading your children, your family, your friends to hell. Why would you do that? People who do this, Kyle, they're deceived while they deceive others, and they don't even know because they will not, they're unwilling to admit, my life doesn't conform to the Bible. They have to twist the word of God to force it to confirm. Because they say, that's impossible. I said, you think God is a man that can only do the work of a man? God only does works that only he can do. If your life hasn't been touched or changed any different than what a moral atheist can replicate in your life, how can you say you have the power of God that has come upon you? Don't listen to the lies of the devil. I was taught I believed those lies to my shame. I taught other people those lies, Kyle. I lived it for decades. Same here. But now I cannot keep quiet. I can only proclaim the truth. And I speak out against the thoughts that are taken up against the knowledge of God. Amen. That is the purpose of this ministry, folks. And we're so thankful you continue to listen to us. It's a, it's a message with authority and power. It's a message that can command the evil spirits to come out, and they must come out, as discussed in Luke chapter 4, verse 36. And you see, it's also a message that we must continue to continue to proclaim and not stop. Just as Peter says, we must always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks us to give an account of the hope that is in us. Amen. We're commanded to. Amen. Gentleness and reverence, and we must be keeping a good conscience. That's right. Must continue to keep a good conscience. Blameless. Yeah. Just as Paul says. He says, why do I have confidence before God? Because I have a clear conscience before God, that with godliness and holy sincerity, I have conducted myself in all things before you. Verse 43 of chapter 4. Why did Jesus say he came? What's his purpose when he came? But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. That's right. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. He kept on preaching. Now, you know, one of the things that we find a lot uh, as we continue to look forward through the Gospels and what Jesus says is frequently says that if any man wants to be a disciple of Christ, that we must deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow after him. For whoever seeks to lose his li- or to save his life will lose it, but whoever is willing to lose his life in this world will gain it to eternity. And a lot of people don't understand that. They don't understand it. Now, when Jesus went to the disciples and he first gathered them, and he says, hey, come and follow me, what did they do in, in chapter 5, verse 11? Did they delay? Now, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. That's right. And later they received the promise of the Holy Spirit after Jesus' ascension. And then at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was sent from the Father by Christ, uh, they received the promise of the Spirit. And they were changed into new creations. And they lived impossible lives. Wonderfully powerful lives. Amen. Now, for Jesus, when he, he went about, In chapter 5, verse 17, why was Jesus able to do healings? One day he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. That's right. The, The power of his father, who was Yahweh, was present for Jesus to perform healing. And, and you know, the Bible says... Afterwards, that w- that we are to go and not just proclaim the word of God. We're, we're to go and we're to do all the same signs. Jesus said, the same signs and the same works and greater you will do. We're commanded to speak the same words and we're commanded to perform the same works. 
It's the same Spirit of God, the same fullness of deity that we're to be filled with that Christ had. That's discussed and taught in Colossians and Ephesians. We cover it in both those books. Ephesians is probably is, is probably the most powerful one. It, it talks about what it means to be part of the temple of God, the Spirit of God dwelling in you, and what that is and what that means. Uh, and again, that's in the Ephesians chapter two through five episode that we did. Uh, if you haven't listened to it, if you don't know what I'm talking about it, you need to go listen to that and let the Word of God instruct and teach you, and rely upon the words of God. Now, the other thing some people don't don't understand an aspect of the kingdom of heaven and the authority that has been granted. True believers and sons of God have been granted authority not only to cast out demons, but also to heal. And there's different spiritual gifts. There is a certain gift of healing and and God equips and God distributes the gift as he chooses. And we covered some of that when we did the episode on on tongues, the truth and the lies, because many people are, are abusing uh, the gift of tongues, uh, making false statements and abusing it. And and so we covered that. But we also, it talks about God chooses what gifts he gives certain people. One of those is the gift of healing. Now, in the gift of healing, a lot of people don't understand that when you look at forgiveness or saving, those are relative terms. Uh, to save uh, is, is it's used in the application in the, in the New Testament of people who are saved from sickness, uh, people who are saved from drowning. Uh, people who are saved from death, uh, physical death, people who are saved from eternal death, saved from hell. So just because it says you're saved or you've been saved, it's uh, from what? The penalty of sin, the power of sin, uh, the infirmities of sin? You know, is it sickness? Is it physical death? Is it eternal death? What aspect is it? Jesus says in Luke chapter 5, verse 20, seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. And this was the, uh, I think this was the paralytic. Friends, your sins are forgiven. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? For who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus, aware of the reasoning, reasoning, said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? What is easier to say? Your sins have been forgiven or get up and walk? See, Peter and John, get up and walk. They had the authority to forgive sins and those those infirmities that were a result of sin in this world. And in John, I think it's chapter 20, verse 23, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, Jesus says, the sins of those whom you have forgiven will be forgiven and the sins of those who you have not forgiven will not be forgiven. Now, when you go and you read and you study the Bible, uh, I'm fairly certain and confident because of all the other contexts and what the Bible, when it clearly talks about the topic of who allows entrance into the kingdom of heaven, uh, we come through Christ. Christ is the only way, not another man. Another man cannot uh, forgive your sins and offer you entrance into the kingdom of heaven. So the sins that he's referring to and that, as I read it and as it's applied in other places, in the, is in the context of healing. It's just like in James chapter 5 when it talks about if any man is sick among you, referring to somebody who got sick because of sin. He says if they've uh, committed sins, then the prayer of the elders offered in faith will save him. Now, some translations say heal. The word is actually sozo, to save, but they don't like that word because they don't understand that it's a generic word. And this is, what's, this is what creates some of the confusion in the Bible, Pop, Kyle, because people get hung up on a single word that wasn't translated properly. They apply certain connotations to it and they draw, they draw doctrine instead of looking at the whole context of the chapter in the book and actually know what was intended, even though the word may have been a very poor word choice. And this is the very definition of what Paul warned against on these arguments and over genealogies. You could be genealogies of words as much as anything well, else. It is. It's a lot of it disputes about words and controversial yeah. questions. That's right. If you would just read the whole book and understand the context of the whole book and then look at the chapters, it speaks for itself. You don't need to try to argue over a, 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 a single word and come to a false conclusion because of what you've been taught and in what it's been passed down or the own weakness and powerlessness of your life. Oh, but I only like to to read that which is, comes from the Textus Receptus. Oh, you majority text guys are are uh, are blasphemers. You know that kind of stuff goes on even today, folks. But the message is the same whether you whether you get it from the Textus Receptus or the majority text. That is, you need a new heart. Amen. 
It's the only way. You have to have a new heart. What's easier to say? Your sins have been forgiven or get up and walk? A tax collector. When he meets a tax collector in Luke chapter 5, verse 27, what does a tax what he tells him what to do? What does Jesus tell the tax collector to do when you look at verse 27 and 28? After that, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. Again, he left everything. Now, we, we talked about this earlier, and you've heard me say this, but we're going to cover it again. Um, who does Jesus say are the people that need help in verse 31 and 32? And Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. That's right. Sinners to repentance. The righteous, they don't, they don't need help. And you see, you see very little instruction, in Kyle, in the Bible written to the righteous, uh, written to those who are true servants of God. Typically, it's grace and peace be you, uh, be with you, and, and continue to do what you're doing or do it even more. But much of the Bible, just as in the Old Testament, is written to the masses, the many. The many who are deceived and never receive the new heart and are living a lie. Just as in the Old Testament, we have all those examples and in the New Testament. And then there's also a a smaller amount written to those who had received the Spirit of God, but then because of false words, deceptions of the devil, have been deceived are starting to drift away, the spirit is being quenched, and it's a call to, 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 to turn back to where you were so you don't lose your reward. Now, many of those instructions we find at the very end in, in Revelation, and we did the study of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, that says, what church are you in? Which church would Christ place you in? And many of those commands, unfortunately, are to many of the churches who, if they don't repent, uh, they aren't going to receive a reward. Uh, the eternal reward. Don't lose your first love. That's right, because there was a problem. And so much of what you find in the Bible is written to one of two people. And either way, if those people don't change their condition, they don't enter the kingdom of heaven. One, a group of people who has a, in their mind, they have a sincere desire to serve and to please God, to love him, to love their neighbor as themselves. And they honestly have a sincere desire. The problem is they still have a sinner's heart. They can't overcome the sin that still dwells within them. They're the ones that yell, Lord, Lord, and the door is closed. That's right. And Jesus says, because you continued in sin. Just like Jesus said, those who commit sin are slaves of sin. The slave doesn't get to remain in the house forever, but only the son who's been set free and is no longer a slave of sin. So a lot of what the Bible is written to is to that group of people. They call themselves Christians. They go to church. They're, they're amongst the assembly and the gatherings of the others, but they're deceived. Then you have another group of people who truly did receive the Spirit of God, but through other deceptions and trickery of the devil, uh, through false teaching and also persecutions, people take their eyes of Christ, they start to drift back to the world, and the danger and the warning is if you don't get back and walk in the Spirit, and stay in power, and stay in holiness, and the sanctification that God placed you in, then you're in danger of being broken off as a branch, and you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You're growing up among the thorns. That's right. You'll be the one who it says it chokes off because of the worries of this life, the pleasures of riches, or the pursuit for other things. The, the thorns will choke off the vine and it will become unfruitful. It will stop bearing fruit, and it will die. And and people don't understand this. And so much of the Bible is written to those two groups of people because God's a loving God. Those are the two groups of people that are in danger. There's actually very little written to the the, the group that's doing well. They're doing well. Keep doing what you're doing. And much of it is watch out for all these other people. And then the command to help those people. And if they don't want to repent, then it says you must remove them because they're going to contaminate the others. 
actually says command, remove them out of the church. It is an imperative command, several places. Uh, Kyle, we covered that in the judgment. Yeah, we did. Uh, to judge or not to judge. God commands both. It depends on the what, what the context. And, and just a quick summary of that for those who haven't listened to it. <clears throat> for those who are true believers, you are commanded to judge only in the church and those who are in the church. Those who are outside the church, you're commanded hands off. You're a light to them. You are not to judge them. You're commanded to judge those in the church and actually remove the false and those who don't repent. Amen. Those who can't overcome because they're either refusing to accept the message to get power to overcome or they're loving, they've turned back and they're loving the world and they don't want to turn back even though they have the power, kick them out. But then to the hypocrites who are saying, oh, we need to live godly and you can't be doing that and, and you can't be a murderer and you can't do that. It's like, sorry, sorry, you're no different. You see, God looks at the heart. You commit murder too. You still commit adultery. You still steal. You still envy. You still covet. You still have jealousy and strife and envy. No, no, you you cannot judge it all until you take the plank out of your eye because you don't have a new heart. And ironically enough, right after that parable that he, that he talks about, he then talks about you have to get the new heart. I think that was in Luke. I think Actually, I think it's coming up here in Luke chapter 6. So, Luke chapter 6. And yes, it's it's in uh, verse 41. But before I, I, I get to that, uh, just a couple things. In verse 27 and 28, what does he say we're supposed to do? But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. That's right. Now, he goes on to say in verse 32, if you love those who love you, what credit is that? For who, who also does that, Kyle? For even sinners love those who love them. And so I'll talk to people and they'll say, oh, I know I love God. You see, I love my neighbor as myself. That's the proof I have God in me. I say, okay, uh, do you still sin? Well, yeah, everyone sins. I said, okay, then you're no different than the sinners. Sinners can love too. This word love here that's being used is agape love. Sinners can love too. You see, God created his creation with a capacity of love, but the problem is sin also entered. So now they have two natures within them. God says, you must get rid of the one, but only I can remove it. Do you have faith? Are you willing to come for me? You see, when you come to me, the spirit of God does an impossible work, removes the old heart, gives you a new heart, so that you only have one nature. Don't be double-minded. The double-minded man receives nothing from the Lord. Folks, listen to the episodes we did on James chapter 1 through 5. Do not be the double-minded man. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot be light and dark. You cannot be fresh and bitter. You cannot bear good fruit and bad fruit. I, I don't know what to tell you. The Word of God is very clear. Crystal clear. And again, we have a question. Uh, a question email. You can ask questions. We will do a podcast and address your questions. We'll go through scripture. If there's things that you're struggling, say, you know what? I, I hear what you guys are saying, but I also hear this. How do I reconcile the two? Ask those questions and we'll go through those passages and we'll, we'll, we'll point you to scripture where you can go and study and ask God to show you in his word. What do I believe? So that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Amen. Now, the plank, right? In verse 41, it says, Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and not notice the log that's in your own? Now, he doesn't say. People say, oh, see, he's trying to take out the speck. You're, you, you, you know, leave the guy's speck alone. No, that's not, that's not the point. No, the Bible says you cannot have a single speck of leaven or, or darkness or anything. The problem is this person's a hypocrite. And we covered that in the Matthew. The whole teaching was going through. Talk about don't be like the hypocrite. Don't be like the hypocrite. Don't be like the hypocrite. And gave the example, gave the example. And then it goes to this one. Even in, in, in the even in the judgment uh, series we just finished. Yep. And so 
The problem is this person's a hypocrite. Why do they have a lie if they still have a bad heart? You have no right to judge. You aren't a true servant, a son of God. You have no right. You're still in darkness. But once you get the new heart, once you get the log removed out of your eye, well, then you're commanded to go. And now you can see clearly to go remove the speck out of the brother's eye because a brother's not allowed to have a speck in his. No one. We're to be completely holy, pure, blameless. No leaven. No darkness. No bitterness. No bad fruit. The Father doesn't allow it. Verse 43, there's no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor on the other hand, a bad tree that produces good fruit. You see, each tree, the tree is known by its fruit. Now, all of this comes from what in verse 45? The good tree, the bad tree, it's all indicative of what in verse 45? The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Amen. And we also looked at other passages, in Matthew chapter 12 and Mark chapter 7, and when the passage of God requires a new heart. And, and it then goes we went on through just, a, just about every chapter in Deuteronomy and just about every chapter in Isaiah on the heart. Well, the, and all con- the entire Ezekiel, condition of the Jeremiah, heart episode. But the whole point is the heart, as it continues to talk, it's the thoughts within the heart that That's defile right. you. It's these wicked evil thoughts that pop up that are against God's nature, those are the things that defile you. It doesn't matter if you don't act them out. You're already defiled. That's right. He says in verse 46, what does he say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And he goes in and talks about the man who builds a house on the rock or the sand. You see, it's the doer. It's the doer. Back to Romans chapter 2. I think it's verse 10 or 13. It's the doer of the law that is just before God, not the hearer. In James chapter 1, talking to all these people who are deceived, and he talks about you need to be the perfect man. He says, you you need to, you you have the anger of man. He says, beloved, everyone must be uh, quick to hear, uh, or slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And then it, it can't. If you still have the anger of man that continues to pop up, you don't have... You don't have the righteousness of God. In the very next verse, I think in verse 20 of James chapter 1, it's an imperative command. It says, remove all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. And in humility, he commands them in humility to receive the word implanted, which is able to save their soul. Because they had not received the word implanted that can save your soul. And the very next verse, I think it's now like verse 21, he commands them to become doers of the word and not hearers who deceive themselves. Because they're still living in deception. He goes on to say that they must become the perfect man that looks intently at the perfect law of liberty and abides by it. That man will be blessed, having become the effective doer. He's blessed. He says, if anyone thinks himself to be religious, I think it's in verse 26, and he cannot bridle his own tongue, his man's religion is worthless. He deceives his own heart. The problem is in the heart. And as we continue to go through James, we go into what is the true faith of Abraham? What does it mean to be justified by works? You're like, what? Justified by works? Well, there's a difference, people, between works of the Spirit, works of faith, and works of the law. You're right. Works of the law can never be just. No man can be justified. But somebody who comes in faith, you become a doer. It's works of the Spirit. It's the proof of your faith is what James talks about and Peter talks about. Go listen to these things. Educate yourself with the Word of God and be blessed. So as you continue to look in Luke, in chapter 8, he goes through and talks about the parable. And when you look at the parable, there's the four seeds in verse 11 uh, through verse 15. Now, the fir- there's only one that did not believe. And that's the one whose seed fell beside the road and the devil comes, the bird, and and steals it, steals the word from the heart so that they would not believe and be saved. But all the other three seeds, it talks about they believe and receive it with joy when you receive all the God, when you read all the gospel accounts. They receive uh, with joy and they believe. But the problem is they didn't endure. You see, the second seed, which fell on the rocky soil, they didn't have a firm root. They only uh, believe for a while. And after time of temptation, they fall away. You see, they can't overcome temptation. Whether the temptation is a persecution, whether the temptation is a lust, uh, 
riches, uh, whatever it is, they cannot overcome. They continue to stumble. They don't have the spirit. Uh, the next seed, it grows. It actually becomes fruit bearing and it becomes unfruitful. What causes it to become unfruitful? It gets choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and brings no fruit to maturity. But there's one seed that had the good heart. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. See, the other people, they never had a new heart. The third seed, it appears that they received a new heart but then fell away. But only one endured with perseverance to the end. You know, it's just like Jesus says several times in the Gospels. He says persecutions, trials, they're going to come. He says some many are going to, he says many are going to fall away from the faith. But it's only the one who endures to the end that will be saved. You know, this is a continue is consistent with the commands given to the churches in Revelation in chapter Revelation chapter two and three that we covered in what church would Christ place you in? This is not a new concept, people. This has been around. It's there. It, 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 it's consistent with the Old and the New Testament. Later, um, when his family came to him in verse 19, still in chapter 8, they said his mother and brother came to him and they were unable to get in because of the crowd and it was reported to him, Jesus, your mother, your brothers are standing outside. They want to talk to you. They want to see you. How did, what did Jesus say to them in verse 21? And he answered to, and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. That's right. Those who hear the word of God and do it. But people don't, they just, they don't understand. Now, later in Luke chapter 9, uh, again, he's talking about if anyone wants to become his uh, disciple. What does he say in Luke chapter 9, verse 23 to 26? And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. See, it comes down. Are people willing to lose their life? Are they willing to give up everything? If God wants to change their job, are they willing to walk away and do a different job that God wants them to do? If God wants to take away your possessions and move you and have you do something else, are you willing? Do you freely give those up? If you were to lose everything in a fire or, or a casualty, are you going to be depressed? Are you going to feel like, oh my goodness, I lost all this? You see, someone who has already given those things up and lost them, they don't consider their citizenship citizenship in this world. It's the eternal. You see, I live here and I do my work to man as unto the Lord, not because I love the world, but because I love my God. I live for my God. I do all things for my God. That's why I continue to live here, Kyle. I go into the world not so I can be more of the world, but so I can be light to this dark world, to show them there's so much more greater, there's so much treasure that's richer, there's so much more family and true relationships that are more fulfilling than any earthly family could ever fulfill, if you had simply turned to the true uh, church of God. Most people have a false relationship with Christ. Most people and their glimpse and their knowledge of the relationship of God is through these false church members who are no more of a, of a representation than, than, again, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who had a desire to know God, who fasted, who prayed, who read the Word of God, but they're excluded because they didn't understand in faith they had to get a new heart and a new spirit to be changed into an impossible new creation filled with all the fullness of the deity of God and to live the life that Christ lived. 
The same example, you now being a priest under your high priest, offering your body, your life as a holy and living sacrifice in all your behavior, each day to your Father, proving the will of God every day, all that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. You see, it's not you. Don't be afraid. Don't be thinking like, oh, that's impossible. It's not you. Do you have faith in God? Then let God do what he says he wants to do in you. Let him fulfill his words that he spoke. Later, people wanted to go and follow him and be his disciple. You know, what did Jesus say when you look at verse 57 to 62 of chapter 9? I have to turn the page. Uh, 57 to 69? Uh, to the end, 62. Okay. Okay. Yep. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord. But first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. You see, Kyle, this gets back to, are we willing to lose everything? Do we understand what it means? Jesus says, what do you mean you're going to go bury your father? What do you mean you need to go say bye to your family? Do you not know? And this is what people don't know. An earthly family that doesn't have the true relationship with God? The Bible says they're enemies of God. Why are you seeking to have fellowship? They're already dead. And why do you value the fellowship of those that are spiritually dead and enemies of God over your heavenly Father. The Bible says if you love the world and if you seek to be a friend of the world, then you make yourself an enemy of God. Amen. You see, this is where it comes into Luke chapter 14, verse 26, I think it is, where it says, um, if anyone wants to be a disciple, it says you must hate father, mother, spouse, brother, sister, son, daughter, and yes, even your own life. You must hate them if you want to be my disciple. Now, people don't understand. They say, how can God be a God of love, but yet he commands the hate? Well, when you understand that all those, it's referring to those who have not been born again, who are still of the world. We hate all that the world stands for, not wanting to conform to it because it's of sin. They cheat. They steal, they have wickedness, they have anger of man. Lies. All of it's in the heart. You know, some people are like, well, you're describing like a really wicked people. No, this is what God sees in the heart. Now, most people don't act that way outwardly. Uh, they exercise self-control because we're a nation of laws and of rules, and they know that it's not going to be favorable for them if they behave that way. And, and they want other people to be kind to them, so they want to be kind back because they like friends. But the problem is people in that, they still struggle and carry around the burdens of the thoughts and the sin that wages war in their members because they just don't know. But God, looking at the heart, sees it. He's like, listen, you can't desire those things. Friendship with the world makes yourself an enemy of God. Not where to be in the world, but as lights of the world, being the example of everything that epitomizes that which is holy, just, and true, and righteous. So I know I think we've we've gone a, a long time. I wanted to finish Luke. I don't think we're going to finish. So we might just stop here and I'll summarize where we started because we're here at chapter 10. And I'll probably turn this into a part one and part two for the book of Luke. So everything that we've covered, I, I pray that you can see so far that there's a difference between a sinner and a righteous man. There's a work that God wants to do. There's a work that he does that allows us to endure to the end and overcome, even in the face of temptations and trials. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? How does it read to you? It's in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And Jesus said, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Father, I pray that as people listen, they'll continue to seek your word and truth. Father, that your spirit will give eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, I pray that you'll, O oh God, remove 
any spiritual blindness. Father, remove any stubbornness of the heart. Father, bring a humility and touch the heart of God. Bring it to weeping and mourning and in humility, because you say that you oppose the proud, but you give grace to the humble. Bring them to humility, O God, and let them know that if their heart is still not right, if there's still things in there, they may have the thoughts and the desire to know you, to serve you, to please you. But Father, I pray that if they also see that there's still the wicked component in the heart that hasn't been put to death, that they won't lie against the truth, but they'll come to you in humility and ask you, O God, to do an impossible work. They'll put their faith in that, and they'll trust you to remove and cleanse them from all unrighteousness, to do an impossible work so that they can live as Christ lived, as a holy living sacrifice, and that they also will do the works of God as you grant them your spiritual gifts of ministry according to your will and purpose to equip your church for them to go out in power and authority, to be a light and a witness to you, O God, in this dark world, and to support the church and other faithful believers. Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We hope this weekly program helped rekindle your zeal to know, love, and serve Christ day by day. If you enjoyed the program, consider subscribing and sharing with your friends. Thanks for listening.